Good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everyone? How are you? How are you? How... Oh, right, okay. Oh, well. It's a foggy morning. Oh, hang on. Get the right lenses on. It's a foggy morning. Foggy Monday morning. But it's definitely spring. Spent the weekend working on the garden. Garden looks immaculate. And uh, yeah, I've got this pain in my finger. Sorry, didn't mean to do that. <laughs> Entirely accidental. My middle finger has got a pain in it. It's been clicking for about two months, like click, click, click all the time. So um, Mrs. Angry would have been up the hospital by now for a steroid injection, but not Mr. Angry, oh no. He's gonna power through it. So now I've powered through it to the point where I can hardly bloody use it. It's not a dentistry. I don't actually do much dentistry with my left hand. Being right-handed, so I don't know what that's all about. Anyway, if you uh, happen to know that that's the first sign of any sort of chronic debilitating illness, then please do email me and let me know. So, what's been happening? What's been happening? Well, as usual, there's always something, isn't there? Always something going on. We've got this situation in the surgery, and it's quite an odd situation. In that, you know, I mean, I, you know, when you've been in practice a long time, especially when you've had a break in the middle, as I did, you, you sort of, when you come back, you think, oh, that's different. And you know, some of the things are different in a good way, like the crown cement. Well, I was using zinc phosphate when I sort of had my early retirement, and then. When I come back, we're using uh, Fuji, which is, you know, like in a pre-mixed syringe. It costs uh, £10,000 a tube. But, I mean, it's, it's an amazing cement. I mean, really, it's a GC sem, I think it's called. I don't know. <clears throat> do you know, you don't do any research, do you? I mean, okay, I know there are dentists that are completely anal about materials. But the average dentist, I think, just doesn't have the ability or the time to try and do any do any research as to what the best materials are you've got this massive great catalog that, that's got no information in it whatsoever not even what what the material is just the name and the price and that's it and uh, you're supposed to you know make a wisest move and this Fuji seems to I mean he's brilliant it's scary I'll tell you what it is it actually scares me I mean, at least with zinc phosphate, you knew you were like, it gave you a fighting chance if you cocked it up. But this Fuji, I mean, Jesus, once it's set, that's it. It's like concrete. It's worse than, I, I wouldn't mind if it was concrete. If we was, I mean, zinc phosphate was concrete, wasn't it? But this Fuji, I don't know what it is. It's some, some plastic from outer space. Because once it's set, that's it, mate. You know, if you've got a little bit into in in between the teeth, you can forget. You know, you, you have to take all the patient's teeth out and start again, rather than try and trim it. Anyway, that's not. What, that's, who brought that up? Did you, did you bring that up or did I bring it up? I can't remember. That's not what I was supposed to be talking about. I was, I was going to talk about accepting patients for NHS treatment, that's it. Okay, here's the thing, right? You're an NHS dentist, right? You're working in this stupid system that you've been given and told that is, is a brilliant system. You, it's a stupid system, you know it's stupid, you've got to work it. And basically the system pays you the same flat rate fee, irrespective of how much work you do. All right, okay, now I'm not, you know, I mean, Okay, it pays three flat rate fees. So there is some some concession towards the amount of work you do, but really not much, only three fees, right? The porridge, you know, baby bear's porridge, mummy bear's porridge, and daddy bear's porridge. That's it, you get one of those porridges, there's no cornflakes, there's no sugar frosties, just the porridge, okay? So, so, and this is all uh, sort of predicated on the idea that you're supposed to have a list 
when the system came in and you took over those patients on the new system and because those patients were a sort of a broad church and you had some good ones and some time wasters and some basket cases and some children with no cavities and some dental disasters and the whole thing was a complete melange a patient melange and uh, so your flat rate you know basically if you paid a flat rate for everyone it's all going to work out the famous swings and roundabouts you know these swings and roundabouts that they've got at the department of health i don't know where they are i've never seen them but they've got them and this is the swings and roundabouts are supposed to mean that everything works out fine well of course in game theory it doesn't what happens is you get health speculation and you get a uh, dentist uh, will obviously try and take on patients who need less work money money i mean of course it's not if you're going to pay someone a flat rate of course they're going to try and wiggle out of accepting the patients who need more work and look for loads and loads who don't need much and this idea that oh yeah yeah you don't mind taking on someone who needs a shitload of work and then then you'll miraculously turn them into someone healthy who will, who will then make you money you know make a profit on for the rest of the time that they're with you is just a fantasy well, it worked all right for the, for the existing dentists. I mean, you know, because for the most part, their patients were uh, did come for checkups and were, were well maintained and reasonably healthy. But for any patient, uh, any dentist that's got to take on new patients is a complete disaster. And the worst type of way to take on new patients is to agree with your commissioning authority to take people off their waiting list, because their waiting list consists of people who can't get treatment anywhere. You know, may have tried 10 dentists and been turned down and then finally, finally been forced to throw themselves on the mercy of the commissioning authority and say, please, can you find me a dentist? And then <laughs> they sort of go on the commissioner's waiting list and the commissioners then say, right, well, OK, <laughs> now, who can we offload this onto? Who can we offload this bunch of patients who are almost by definition financial suicide for any dentist to touch? Who can we get them to see? Well, you are not allowed to charge a patient money to accept them on the National Health Service. That has been tried and failed and is a definite no-no. Hang on, junction of death in the fog. Okay, we're all right. So if a patient rings up and, and says, you know, will you take me on the NHS? You can't say, yeah, uh, I, I anticipate a shortfall of about 200 quid on you because you're a new patient and likely to need a ton of work for, for which I can't charge because I get a flat rate. Uh, therefore, I'm going to charge you 200 quid to just to so I can break even in year one. Doesn't work. Not allowed. Uh, absolutely not allowed. Uh, so what do you do if you're a, a resourceful NHS dentist? <laughs> who doesn't want to take on patients with a ton of work <clears throat> you don't you take you send them away you you take them on i mean you don't take them on that's the whole point you just say yeah yeah come in come in we'll give you a check up oh no you need a ton of work you better go away and get that done and then why don't you come back when you've had it all done yeah yeah <laughs> what about how do you like them apples uh, well had, why am I talking about this now? Why are you talking about this now, Angry, you're saying? Why has why this rattled your cage? Well, the answer is that we are getting, we have a direct access hygienist. And we, sorry, roundabout of death. There we go. And uh, <laughs> so we're getting phone calls from patients. And they're the weirdest phone calls, and they're not the sort of phone calls that I would normally expect to get after. And we didn't get 10 years ago, and, and they go something like this. My, I've been to see uh, an NHS dentist, and he says I've got gum problems um, <clears throat> that need to be sorted out. And so um, he's, he suggested that I uh, go and see a hygienist before I come back. And we're like, really you know I mean has a dentist not got a hygienist has he not got a hygienist I mean what's his I mean I know dentists don't some dentists don't do surgical extractions of wisdom teeth and I, I mean I'm one of those some people don't do um, some people you know I mean some of them don't like doing root treatments even though they should 
and uh, you know a lot of them don't do implants and stuff like that but but scale and polish <laughs> what's with these dentists that don't do scale and polishing you know I mean even if you haven't got a hygienist the dentist can do a scale and polish and if they're an NHS practice and they've accepted this patient on the NHS, which was a reasonable assumption I'd made because they'd obviously they'd given them an appointment, got them in, given them a checkup, then then I, I mean I know the old problem was that the scale and polish is technically involved, you know, is a, is a band one treatment. Therefore, you know, they can have it done within the checkup fee, and a lot of dentists didn't like that, and so they tried putting scale and polishing in band two, which was it strictly illegal and the Department of Health cracked down on that and then they started saying no uh, you know you need more than a scale of polish you need a hygienist visit and the hygienist doesn't work on the health service and so the Department of Health wised up to that and they cracked down on that so now they're just saying um, no I'm not going to accept you on the health service if you need hygiene now and so of course what they're doing is they're ringing around and saying you know have you got a hygienist and uh, we're saying yes. Oh, hello, big smash up. Oh, be another big smash up if I don't watch the road. A car there with its um, roof cut off. Never a good sign. Yeah, so, so they're ringing us up and saying, look, uh, have you got a hygienist? You know, I need to see a hygienist. Urgent, you know, urgent, urgent. And we're like, yeah, we've got one. Open, open access hygienist if you want to come and see her oh yeah can you put me in you know I've rung around and the only other surgeries that you know that might accept me are uh, won't see me until half past November anyway well, I had a young woman in last week I'd say yeah, a young woman she's in her 20s which for me is a young woman and uh, she had a UG and it's actually uh you know, um, rare to see AUG where I am. It's, you know, it's, I wouldn't say it's, uh, you know, impossible, you know, we don't, how can I put it? It's rare, okay, we just don't see it, okay, a lot, I used to see a lot of it in the Medway towns 30 years ago, but not, not so much now. It's a sort of a, it's an active disease rather than the chronic gum disease, and it's um, characterized by uh, the, very very rapid destruction of the periodontal membrane and in fact when we looked at her, her it looked, she looked like she'd had a, a flap reflected from her lower incisors it was the, the destruction was that quick and it's common amongst people who for some reason don't uh, you know go through a phase of not really looking after their teeth at all and university students, you know, the, for the first time away from their parents, God knows what they get up to, but they tend to get it. And, and it was always, you know, uh, it was rampant in places like trenches and shelters where hygiene was a problem. <clears throat> and it's uh, diagnosed by a sort of characterized halitosis. So it's sort of very, very easy to see this thing. So the, the, the dentist, and she'd just been to see a dentist like a few days ago, as in, as in, had been prescribed metronidazole by this dentist, and, but hadn't yet picked up the prescription because it wasn't ready. She'd literally come from the dentist to the pharmacist, dropped the prescription off, spent a day ringing around trying to find a, a hygienist to sort her gums out, and hadn't yet picked up the metronidazole. She was going to do that the same day. So obviously we told her that you know metronidazole was was the correct treatment. Now that in that was the only respect in which what she had received was the correct treatment. You know, I mean thank thank the Lord that they the dentist had at least prescribed a metronidazole and not antidepressants or um, or painkillers or something. You know, because you won't believe what's going on now. You you would not believe it. The stories that are coming out of the National Health Service are frankly incredible. And I mean, really, how the Department of Health is missing this, I do not know. I think it's been, they're not looking. They're either not looking for it, or the systems they've got in place can't detect it. Or they do, or they they hear about it anecdotally and they're ignoring it, and which I think is far more likely. So she came to us, and we did what 
I would want anyone to do for one of my children, which is we did so far as possible because it is quite sometimes it's quite painful. We we as far as possible removed the scale that she had around her teeth, her lower incisors and showed her how to use disclosing tablets and packed her off with some disclosing tablets and a brush. And now I'm hoping that um, she, if she comes back to us, which I, it's possible that she won't because, you know, I mean, <clears throat> you're looking at 50 pounds a visit to see us and, you know, the, the young people don't have necessarily have the sort of wherewithal, even if it involves saving their teeth to spend that sort of money you know they're just like a physical impossibility for them if it's a case of finding finding 300 quid or losing your teeth uh, unfortunately sometimes it means losing your teeth but it shouldn't do because we have a national health service for for precisely this sort of situation where people can't afford to come and see a, a private hygienist or a private dentist for for the for this treatment now, and I just don't understand what happened in that surgery. First of all, I don't understand how, how the dentist doesn't have an ethical dilemma doing what he's doing. Secondly, I don't understand how, how he is getting away with triaging his patients and refusing to see the ones that uh, require any sort of reasonable amount of work. And thirdly, I don't understand on a technical reason, on a technical level, how he's prescribed that patient metronidazole, because without accepting them on the NHS, you know, I mean, if you're, um, if a patient comes along to you as an NHS dentist and sits in your, you know, who's who's desirous of NHS treatment, and sits in your chair and you do a checkup to the extent that you can diagnose. Um, and treatment plan, uh, a per a, an acute periodontal condition, and presumably didn't issue a private prescription. They must have issued an NHS prescription. Hence, the, the you know have to leave it with the pharmacy. Blah blah blah. How the hell that patient is not accepted on the NHS? How are they then? How can you then turn around and say, oh yeah yeah yeah, but I didn't accept them on the NHS? Of course you did. Of course you did. This is not a corporate, okay? I did ask because we are, we're, you know, I'm sort of quite, how can I put it? I'm quite alert to corporate practices and I was wondering if this was a corporate. But in fact, in, in this respect, I think the corporates are probably better than the independents because the corporates probably haven't sunk quite this low in this respect. They still do want a lot of NHS, new NHS patients and they've got these sort of, uh, bulk you know the mass to absorb the occasional patient that does need a ton of work um, and and they their abuses are elsewhere in the system you know their abuses are in uh, economies of scale or not I mean economies of scale is not an abuse but I mean their abuses are in uh, how they employ their associates and, and things like that not necessarily you know it, for them the stakes are very high bending the NHS regulations for a corporate is, is a big no-no, you know, because you've got a, perhaps a multi-million pound contract at stake. I mean, even even a reasonably large independent practice may have a multi-million pound contract now. Um, so you can imagine what a corporate stands to lose if the department, if they fall out of favour with the Department of Health. But what, do you know what makes me most cross about the whole affair is that this, this girl, right, needed the dental profession. This was a, a time, her time of need. She came came to the NHS, an NHS practice with a reasonably simple, well understood, easily diagnosed, easily treated uh, problem, and got nothing. Got rejected. Got sent away with a prescription for metronidazole, and and. You know, sending her as if sending her away wasn't bad enough. She got sent away with instructions to have the treatment that she needed and then come back. I mean, where the hell do they think she is going to get the treatment that she needed? They are the people who are supposed to be prescribing. They're, they're supposed to be doing the treatment that she needed. What are they? What do they think they're there for? Do they think they're there just to, to scoop the cream off the top of the milk and then send everyone else? 
what, what is the National Health Service coming to? And this is not the first case. This is the most egregious case that I've come across, but it's not the first case, which is why I mention it. We will get other phone calls from other people asking if we've got a hygienist because this practice will carry on doing this. They will carry on sending people away who need treatment because basically they just, they'd rather just take the money and not do the dentistry. Thank you very much. Right, I'm sorry to have to tell you this. I'm off to do some dentistry. So I will talk to you tomorrow. All right, bye.